I suppose it's actually, uh, I, it's very hard to, to, to follow what Indy has just said because I think it's so transformational and so thought-provoking um, for everybody in the audience, but I think it, it, it's extremely relevant to, I suppose, the point at which we started this morning. Uh, and, I, and I suppose I feel in a way we've, we've come around in a circle um, back to a point to talk about the fundamental importance of craft, of creativity and of design in our lives. And uh, I don't want to take up too much of the time because um, I'm sure that in the audience there are a lot of burning questions. So um, I'm going to throw it out and I'm just also going to say that before I throw any questions out that we also have some of our speakers who are still here and I'm sure if they're handed a mic and asked a specific question would be more than happy to answer that. Um, so I think we have Kirsty and Fee and Anne uh, and who else can I see down there in the audience? Um, Anybody else? Did I miss anybody? No. But anyway, are there any questions? There's roving mics going around. Yeah. It's John. Thank you. Um, a question directed to Jarmo, but also other people in the group. A lot of speakers today talked about multidisciplinary collaboration in order to innovate. Um, your team are across many disciplines uh, who have different values, different ways of communicating. Uh, is there particular strategies that you employ to try and help people with very different values and visual languages or technical languages to innovate together? Um, not so much in terms of the execution of the ideas, but coming up with the ideas. The, uh, that's, a, that's a good... Good, very good question. I think it's uh, also visible in the in the larger scale. I like the knitting factory ex example here, uh, the knitting machine ex example. That in the day of uh, that that machine is digital, programmable, has a big big amount of of computing capacity, and yet it lacks the kind of fundamental element, which is easy to use user interface, which is like, uh, and that's that's very typical, I think, for. The stage where we are, this kind of splintered, splintered landscape that we are uh, at different different sectors of professions and industries are good at different things, and they are pretty pretty bad at kind of a lending solutions from the neighboring sector. And that's of course it's the whole reasoning for multidisciplinary teams. That the idea is that yeah, I might be the best economist in the world, but if if I can join forces with a great data scientist. Uh, I, I can I can learn that there are quicker ways to get data and and uh, work with data than, than my classical econometric metrical tools uh, uh, or teachers taught me. Uh, but yes, there's the language issue. Um, the best way is through pragmatic work. So we we do we do work a lot in sprints. Uh, if you give a group of people a concrete task and limited amount of time and uh, and and kind of freedom to decide how to solve it using design driven tools the language barriers tend to be sorted out by discussing a shared challenge so I, th I think that's the maybe the key thing. I've also seen that in, uh, in, in working with the for example different city departments if you try to sort out the Contradictions uh, in an abstract manner, it will never. It becomes politicized, poli politicized, and uh, and impossible. But if there's a common challenge they try to address, they both approach it from their own viewpoints and they meet in the middle. So it's uh, concrete work seems to be the best best way. And I also like the. Uh, I think Xerox Park had had a methodology that you always give a bit too little resources and too little time for the teams that they are under pressure and then they sort of. Uh, the diamond comes out. I'm not sure if the bit's best for the st stress management viewpoint, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's the reality of working life anyway, so it's good to learn it. Uh, I think that the interesting thing sometimes about language as well is that actually from the presentations we saw today, and I'm going to ask Dries for his commentary on this, but actually some of the richness of the work that you've been doing, Dries, is that you're actually getting a very disparate visual language from the way that you're working and interacting you know, across the globe. And I mean, that's, I think, part of the foundation of what, what we've just been discussing through the talks today. Would you agree? Would you have anything to add to that? Uh, what did you say about language? The, 
Well, I suppose the question came from uh, getting different people from mm -hmm. either different groups or communities mm -hmm. or, or, or specialisms to be able to communicate effectively together. Yeah. yeah. Um, where do I start? Um, I, I, I think for me what, there's a few tools that I think we use, like when I first had this kind of idea of combining clay with 3D printing, that was at the time when 3D printing was still this kind of um, industrial device. So one thing I could do is go to a company and say, I want to put clay in your uh, $80,000 or $200,000 machine, and they would like look at me. Uh, yeah. It's not going to happen. Um, so the, the, what we always try is, is just make this very rough proof of concept. And, and I think that's where trying to be a generalist at things. Uh, and, and we're always kind of take naivety as a, as a proud um, kind of uh, characteristics in, in that we're, um, we're not programmers. I'm really bad at it. Uh, me not mechanical engineers, we're really bad at it. Um, not material scientists, also pretty bad at it. Um, but know just enough to throw together a kind of a prototype and then when you show that to people, they're like, ah, okay, but yeah, uh, just you can change that or look at this or contact this person or that person. So it's kind of trying to be a sponge and absorb as much as you, as you can from all these different fields. And, and exactly language is very important because in ceramics, they would call it a deflocculant and in science, uh, technical ceramics, a dispersant. It's exactly the same thing that kind of changes the property of clay. So you need to adopt these different dialects of, of, of different people. And it always takes really, uh, we, yeah, when you start to talk with someone, you, you always have to take this kind of um, weight approach or something, or and then, and then slowly gain confidence that you also know a little bit about it. So, um, I'm going completely off track here. No, that's uh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, so being generalists, do it yourself and then put something out and then people can respond uh, mm -hmm. to it. That works so much more effective than coming up with a big idea and saying, like, I want to do this, help me, please. And, and I was pretty naive also in open sourcing everything that I thought like, ah, I throw it out and now people are going to improve it. And no, I got just thousand more questions like, ah, can you improve this or that? Or uh, and, and so I started the struggle again, trying to improve. And, and that's why I was so laughing when I saw that what I considered the completely failed uh, printer extruder showing up in a slide. So apparently someone has it working. And um, that's, <laughs> that's, that's kind of, yeah, yeah, that's kind of fantastic. And um, the, 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 the difficulty is all, always kind of pulling it back into the system. Right? Clearly, someone figured it out, so I have to pull it out again and feed it into the into the system. But um, does anyone else want to come in on that? Or the, uh, Yarma was talking about the thing of um, squeezing people into a room and getting them to do stuff really quickly. And I've had that experience where we used um, Lego model building as a sort of a de-threatening way to because people get if you give people pen and paper, they get very scared mm. about it and they can't draw properly. But if you give them Lego or plaster scene to work with, they can make models and, and use those models as a way to talk about visual things very quickly. So say if you're working with a group of um, medical people, nurses or doctors or something, that 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 kind of de uh, skills and de-threatens the the uh, the visual conversation stuff. But I've also had the the experience of doing work with people over long term. And I think that's where you, you kind of get to know them and you get to know their, what they're actually interested in doing and their skill base. And you can, um, you can kind of negotiate the project. And then as you're working with a team of people on more and more projects, it's, it becomes a, a, um, you know, the, a more democratic kind of relationship and you can share it out easily. Um, all the, listen to all the presentations there, I was really struck by all the different ways people found their collaborators. So we had the, say like I was talking about how I'd found the, the, this process, welding process by accident to the factory. Mm -hmm. And then we had, um, we had Shelley who literally had an accident and she, uh, she, that changed her practice. And we have Dries doing his, um, Dries, you know, disseminating the stuff all around the world digitally and finding people to, who, ends up collaborating, working mm. with them. It's amazing the, the 
kind of variety of uh, collaborators. Fee, I thought was re I really liked that one because it's so hard to find people in factories that are going to be good to work with, and I think she's she's uh, putting in all that time and effort, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know opening up all those possibilities. It's brilliant. Yeah. So. Very exciting. It's, uh, it's yeah. also about finding, finding within a, a factory or within a science institute or finding those people that are also kind of super specialists but also a little bit generalists. Mm. And who yeah. also um, prepared to take the time because yeah. certainly at the beginning until you've built a relationship where they realise the value of what you're bringing, mm. um, you are, you're an extra. You're the thing that might mean that they don't go home on time or they don't have a lunch break. So for a little while, yeah, yeah. the language, you're... You need to find people who are prepared to go out of their way a little bit um, and who are prepared to take some risks. And, mm -hmm. and I think there's um, a balance between that kind of high pressure, kind of here's a, here's a problem to solve in a moment, and then actually there's, here's a conversation, we don't know where it's going, but we both believe it's worth having. And uh, the language grows out of th those two different styles of, of conversation, I think. Yeah, yeah. Great, thanks, John. There's is there another question there? From, yeah. Hi, well done on a great day. Fantastic panel of speakers and really interesting. Um, I just wanted to make an observation on Annie's um, remark in her opening address this morning. She talked about the fact that KPMG were able to say how much value was added by the creative and the art sector, but the biggest difficulty was that there was a lack of awareness. And my very simplistic question was, first of all, going to be, what other way could we raise awareness other than through publications and events, which Annie mentioned? And then, of course, we had the last um, presentation a moment ago, which was completely radical in terms of highlighting the need for cultural democracy. And one last observation then <laughs> is my own um, observation over the years in terms of cultivating cultural democracy that it probably takes somebody like Anne Mulrooney leading the charge in terms of looking at institutional innovation and really engaging and getting out of the, these fantastic creative uh, organisations to engage people outside of the room today who need to be part of this conversation if we're to progress towards what our last speaker was talking about in 50 years' time. Um, and I'm just wondering how that can possibly be done because it's, to me it seems like a huge shift for makers who are trying to progress their work and for the institutions who are still trying to hold their own also. So who wants to take that? <laughs> Anybody? I, I, think that, I think the first change begins with yourself and your own conviction and your belief in, in, in what you do and how, and, and continuing to do it with as much sort of passion and professionalism as you can. Um, and so, little by little, you become an example that people they, people say, oh, I know someone who does this. And so, I've, I mean, through the Crafts Council's uh, Parallel Practices Programme at King's, um, I was able to, to speak to and get involved with a whole network of young scientists who now email me and come to my studio, and um, we've got funding to do something at Bush House now. So, I think you begin small and, and, and be the change you want to see. Um, and then I suppose it's a pincer movement with um, people like Karen's remarkable work with the government here, getting sort of get, making them trip over her so that they recognise the value and finding other ways of proving the value of, of all these individual ripples that are making a difference in our own way. I think um, it can be very dispiriting if you um, get involved with a political debate um, if, you're a, if you're a maker because um, it feels as if it's the wrong way around. My, my view is that if I, if I do, my, do what I can in my way and um, so there's as much passion and professionalism as I can, then there's a chance that the people I touch and engage with will, in their turn, pass it on. So passing it forward seems to me to be the way I can do it. What we try to do, let's take an example of the uh, future of planning work. Basically, basically, in the future of planning, we, uh, we want to disrupt and existing industry, which is kind of planning consultancy or PAC, a slow system. Uh, and there's resistance. And the way we propose to do it, if it was sort of a grassroots up, bottom up, up, party party planning, the only way to get any traction to that is to show that it's actually a better alternative for the current system. And the uh, reasoning which we, to which we are building evidence is that it will lead to construction quicker. And because time is money, 
you can build a monetary value on it. Sorry about it, but that's, uh, Indy is doing the J, same, the dark, dark matter labs. They have disruptive concept, right? Actually, they often use economic, economics mm. to prove that if we do this, the end result will be better than the current situation, also financially. It's, that's the uh, condition makers don't understand much else. Yeah. So, it kind of like has to be turned into language of money somehow. Well, Sorry about it. Can, can <laughs> That's I, translating I, yeah. Yeah, can, from one language to the other. Yeah. Mm. I mean, can I ask, is, is there a risk uh, within that? Because, you know, for the last decade or more, we've been hearing about uh, the creative industries and that they're the new economic driver. Um, you know, and, and actually that's probably been put, putting a lot of pressure on things like councils and organisations to respond to government. Um, and is there a risk in, inherent in that? I mean, do we need to move away from, from that concept that everything needs to be measured economically? And how can we do that? It would be nice if uh, there were, but looking from the outside, I'm a recent Londoner, one and a half years. Mm. I think UK creative industries have done pretty well in the situation where public funding has been substantially shrinking and they've been able to defend Great. their share. Yeah. So I put a claim that even though it's been probably a struggle, it would be worse off if that struggle hadn't been fought. So yeah. I, I don't see currently other other model. Uh, I generally would like to. I'm a big fan of Thomas Piketty and the uh, grow, uh, sort of uh, limits of growth thinking. But yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Well, I think that there are models like, like Fee's remarkable work, I mean, where yeah. you, you find pockets of productivity. And, that's possible. Yeah. And those, as I say, that's a kind of grassroots model that you were talking about, and that these factories which have downtime or that have skills and um, teams which have parts of the day or parts of the year where they're not being used, I think that we kind of fill out those cracks in the coral reef of, of the economy and start to make it live again. Mm. Maybe one other point, I think, which is... It's possible to build also local economies, mm. so you know, kind of digitalized uh, networks which work a bit like crystal pounds, but through exchange of, uh, of goods and knowledge and goods and, and services. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. Any more questions on the floor? No. Being a rock star situation here, we don't only see a. Kind of <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> it seems that whenever you guys are doing your, your projects or whatever you love, it seems like you have a lot of freedom in what you do. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case or if you're somehow restricted, but how do you go to that point where, let's say you're in my situation where I'm studying like furniture design and I, I, I'm just getting a proof of concept, let's say, right? Um, how do you get from that point to the, the possibility of saying, okay, well, you know what, I'm actually interested in, in X and I want to kind of follow, follow from, let's say, what I'm doing now all the way to, for example, creating a, um, I don't know, um, creating a 3D printed uh, clay picture or whatever the case might be. Like, the, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the actual freedom of, of not being restricted by, let's say, your, your project or your... Everything else in life. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. You start by cutting out the economic equation. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. I, I think for us, it, it, I cut it all out of this presentation. But in, in 2008, I think, because as students, we were with a couple of people always doing this kind of projects. And then you graduate and you figure out that there's no, the economic reality is a little bit different. So you start doing other things that um, earn money. And we got that exact question, I think in 2008, like how do we see ourselves in, in 2030? And we wanted to do more, go back more to those uh, kind of, um, let's not call it research based because it was, it's, it's more intuitive, it's more, kind of out of our belly feeling, bringing things together and seeing where that leads. And so we started selling shares of stock in Unfold. Uh, so we just printed 100 pieces and sold them to friends and family and, 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 and uh, total strangers. Um, and that gave us just this little seed money to, to, to build that first printer and then to, to really kind of remove all the other distractions and, and, and 
and work from there again and then just sticking to it, you know, being stubborn and <coughs> just keep on building your kind of story and your kind of and 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 the and then trying to uh, to to translate that in the beginning we did lots of of, of these things that end up in museum like there there's nobody buys this nobody buys uh, well now so, somebody did but l'artisan électronique as an installation it's like a huge it's not something people want they love it but it's not something you can earn money with so then you have to go and and, and figure out how to translate all those things all those um, um, and narratives and scenarios and ideas that you have. Because we were naive in the beginning, thinking that, that companies would automatically come to us, like, oh, that's great, and uh, uh, no, it's, it's still too abstract. You have to translate it for them. So uh, we, we actively take every opportunity when we get in touch with, um, so we, we've done recent these uh, ceramic perfume diffusers for Aesop, we've done some projects for L'Oreal in, in, in translating some of those things into, um, Products and scenarios and and and, and things. So it's, uh, yeah. The only answer is hard work, I think. And um, yeah, not 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 being not thinking. Uh, I already said it, said it. Naivety, um, because uh, don't don't always trust everything. Like every ceramist, uh, I only did some evening classes. Every ceramist told me it was impossible because there's all these pockets of air in between the lines of printing. And, and that's this inherited uh, knowledge that is as a baggage on people's shoulders. And, and if you're a bit naive and, and coming from an outside perspective, you don't have that baggage. And that's, that's a nice thing. And now I completely understand actually what most ceramists don't understand is what the problem is with tiny air pockets in clay. Uh, and so now I can tell ceramists what the problem is with air pockets <laughs> in clay. Um, so yeah. Learning while doing and, and, and kind of absorbing all that things that you see everywhere and trying to mingle them together and, and weave new new things out of it. Is that any anyhow an uh, answer to your question? <laughs> okay. Colleen, do you want to come in on that as well? Um, I guess I'd say um, uh, finding a way of working that you really enjoy. So I'd say, you know, in, in university you move from project to project and you're, you're given these co constraints that you have to work within. I think when you leave and you're do, setting up your own career or your own kind of lifestyle, it's finding some way of working that you really enjoy. May, it might be the location, the people you're working with, the processes, the materials, but it's, it's kind of, um, you don't want to be going into the workshop in the morning and um, it's like a real grind. So I know, some, I know quite a few silversmiths in Sheffield and there was one guy who was doing all this really shiny polished work and it was just miserable. He, he developed an allergy to the um, wet and dry paper and his skin was all peeling off and stuff. And, and the day he, um, he stopped doing that kind of polished work, he was just, it's changed his life. He became such a happy person. So <laughs> I think that's the, I think that would be my, it's to, to feel around and think, what, out of all the stuff that I'm doing, which bits of it really make me happy? So it might not necessarily be making, it might be the design or it could be the organization or the management of projects or there's lots of different areas. So it's finding that sweet spot that you really, that, that is more interesting than watching Netflix. So, <laughs> so do we have one final question? Hi. Um, obviously, collaboration has, is what it's all about uh, our, with all of the presentations today. And I was just thinking, you know, with a lot of the practices are reliant on very highly skilled industry. Um, and in relation to this, do you feel that we in Ireland and the UK need to reassess our educational models and approach to this? Um, and, you know, because obviously, if you're working as a, as a craftsperson and you're, you know, working on a particular technique and, you know, it may be Makumegani or something, it's very, very specialised and niche and, and generally one-off pieces. But if you want to cater to kind of ma more mass market or, or at least, you know, tap into that level of production, um, how do you feel that we need to address that in our educational model that we have today in relation to what you guys are doing? Yeah, I'm going to ask uh, Shelley to talk about that first, if you don't mind. Sure, I suppose I, what I'm finding, particularly in glass, is that there are, because going to college to do something so 
difficult and risky and expensive um, is quite off-putting for all sorts of people. Um, that there are alternative models of education that are popping up. Lots of people are now going to master classes and individual classes or come to me for tutorials. I mean, there are, I do, there are, there's a whole network of alternative sort of parallel education that's happening in the craft sector at the moment, which I think is really interesting and liberating. So although it means that the students aren't getting the same kind of conversations between um, different disciplines, they're actually developing a set of craft making skills that are very hard to come by in current sort of higher education institutions. So I think um, it's worth thinking again about how we train ourselves as craftspeople and, and thinking about the way we maintain our skills. I've just trained as an electrician because I needed to learn that to do what I want to do next. So I think we, if we think of ourselves as, as being in ongoing um, development and there not being a moment when we finish training, I think that's going to be a much richer and more sustainable way of thinking about, um, about education in the future. Uh, yeah, just a, maybe. I mean, Finland have an interesting model. Mm. Finland has an interesting model when it comes to schools. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I won't go into long brag about that. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't entirely suck, uh, and it's all based on trusting the uh, that the teachers know what they are doing. There are no no like uh, standardized exams. Nothing. Mm. Uh, no homework. Except, well, there definitely is homework. That's that's a lie. But anyway, uh, what I was, I think the um, the main point regarding the uh, educational system, I think it's the, uh, if it's uh, if it's like very target based, it will always miss the target. Uh, and I think the uh, main issue it might be missing currently is that the, uh, the there's nothing which teaches you better to collaborate than uh, than learning to drop your shields, uh, which you can gain from an arts education. It's like a sub byproduct of arts education that, that you know you learn to play. There's no no innovation without playing around. And uh, if the school doesn't give you tools to like consciously and professionally play around, then you have to like retrofit yourself after you're not a kid anymore, and that's much harder than uh, than it than it's for kids. So uh, it's old old. I mean it's a million times repeated fact that the uh, Macs are a success because Steve Jobs had a hobby in calligraphy. Mm. That's why <laughs> she, he paid so, so much attention to the visual interface. Okay, yeah. I guess that's what I was trying to say is that current, certainly the, co the colleges that I'm seeing aren't necessarily offering the, the students the time to play and the access yeah. to, the, to the technical training that they need in order to really come out with, with, that, com with that combination of, of of skill and um, an innovation, and so we look, they're looking for other ways of doing that. That's all. Because it's, it's a technique. Yeah. 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 Colleen, would you agree? Um, yeah, I'd say okay. you know it's, you've got a, this responsibility. It's endless um, training, and I'm do, I keep taking on different kinds of roles and projects, and I've got to learn new stuff. And I think that goes on. However, I'd also say there's I definitely think there's room for real specialisation and becoming a master craftsperson mm -hmm. in the material ceramic, glass, metal, or it's some combination of them. But there's, that's sort of, what is it, 10,000 hours it takes to become an, an expert. And I do, I do think there's always going to be room there for people to be focused on one thing. I do know some makers who just make stuff and they have dealers and gallerists who deal with all the business side and they kind of, they live like little hermits producing stuff and just post it out, never, mm. never engage with social media. But then I also know all the, you know, there's so many different models of how you construct your life and your career and the combinations of things. So it's all individual, really. Yeah. And Dries, anything more to add about education or play? Uh, yeah. Um, super important. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, as, as students, we also build our own, because the school didn't really have the tools, so we build our own little kind of workshop and we shared it with different people. But it's it's uh, I spent now I think uh, yeah, twelve years in education and um, I always leave when there's no room to 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 play when the school invests thousands and thousands of of of, of euros in machinery 
but then closes it off and makes it like a, a print service that you send your file to and you, you come and pick up your 3D print or your CNC stuff. Nothing is going to happen because the students don't understand what's happening. They see it as something you sent and you get back. And, and I always try to, in, in my teaching, crack that open. And, and that's when fun stuff happens. And, and I had one time in Colorado State University, we were teaching a class of um, digital manufacturing to um, students from all the different departments, so traditional ceramics and metal smithing and uh, bringing them in the digital manufacturing lab. And I had one um, student, she was already a bit uh, older student, uh, coming from Korea, and she was looking like, oh. Uh, so um, I explained all the machines, and, and I, uh, I saw kind of a scare in her, in her face um, when I explained uh, how everything worked. And then I told her, like, the laser cutter is basically a computer-controlled heat source. And for a ceramist, the heat is, like, apart from clay, the primary uh, tool. And the next week, she was gone. She was not there. So I thought, like, okay, I lost her. And then the week after, she came back. And she threw, like, dozens of tiles in the laser cutter with glaze, without glaze, fire tiles, unfired, bone dry, like, the whole widget she threw in it. And just this, this little switch, like it's, it's just a heat source that you control with a um, computer and it's not a cutter with laser. And, and that suddenly like a whole new world opened. And, and that's, I think that, that play is so important, like this abstracting, you know, all this stuff you get in school, you need to abstract it, you know, take some distance from it and start to flip it around and play with it. And, and, and that's when you make something new. If you just take it as what it is, then yeah. And I, I think yeah, I think it's it's a great note to end on because I think that if uh, Jeff Powers was here from Heatherwick Studio and it's his keynote where he started off and an awful lot of about what they were doing there was about play and experimentation with simple tools. Um, I think today has been uh, enlightening f for me. I, I I hope it has been for you, the audience as well. Um, just to wrap up on a, on a few themes, I think there's, we've been talking about interconnectedness, collaboration, experimentation, um, the availability of open source, not, not being closed around your ideas, being uh, open to sharing them, uh, being able to push the boundaries, appropriating uh, traditional tools of manufacturing, and uh, I think Colleen, you said, working at the edge of those tools and, and pushing the, the boundaries of those. And I think it's also maybe made us a little think a little bit about our role and our ethical role when it comes in, in relation to uh, making or appropriating uh, things and looking at the circular economy, looking at sustainability and looking at waste. And I think also what came through today for me as well uh, was what John Berger wrote about many, many years ago in a different context, was, but about ways of seeing, because I think that the, the uh, presentation by Fabian earlier uh, around augmented reality and actually a lot of what you were saying, Shelley, in the, in the kind of places that your work and research is bringing you to, to is actually revealing another way for us to see and another way for us to interpret in, in, in a very visual way. Um, and I think that we are very much at that point of the democracy of making, and I think it's a, quite a challenging and frightening time, but I think it's a hugely exciting time. Um, so I would like you to join me in, in thanking all of the speakers. I think they've done an amazing job and for traveling to Dublin today. Uh, we hope you'll come back. So if you don't mind. Just to say, I have a few more thanks to, to, to say before I say, say those. Uh, I'm just going to say that the video uh, from today will be available on both Design and Crafts Council and Crafts Council uh, UK websites. It will uh, have the presentations uh, that we agreed not to publish removed. Um, but <laughs> apologies. Uh, but we do have Vox Pop in interviews with all of our speakers today as well. So you'll get a, a little insight uh, on all of the speakers today. Um, we are also asking you to complete the survey. I don't know if was there a link? Yeah, <coughs> well, there, should, there will be a link to a survey there uh, in a moment. It's really important if you've enjoyed today and you want Makeshift uh, to come back to Ireland, and that is our intention in working with our partners in the UK, it's really important that we get uh, your feedback, good, bad and indifferent, uh, hopefully a little bit of good or a lot of good, um, because it'll really help us to make the case to bring these type of events back. Uh, and I also want to say thank you for, to all of the colleges. I know some of them had to leave, uh, just timing of buses. Hugely encouraging to see students 
uh, here today because really the reason that we're bringing these people here is because you are our future and we want you to take all of that inspiration and insights on board and, and make it real and make it real uh, for us here in Ireland and, and for everybody uh, across the globe. So I just want to finally finish with saying a few thanks um, to the team at DCCOI. Uh, we have an incredible team and when there's a large event happening, everybody rallies around uh, and these events wouldn't come off as they do if, if that didn't happen. So a huge thanks to you. Uh, a huge thanks to the team at the uh, Crafts Council in the UK, particularly Alma, uh, is it Dakalas? I can't say your surname, Alma, sorry, I apologise, but you know who you are. Um, to be honest, <laughs> this event uh, and the calibre of speakers that we had here today would not have been possible without Alma. Um, she has been fantastic work to work with. She has incredible connections. Um, and I think everybody sitting around me here actually said yes because they got a call from Alma and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't say no. Um, also, I want to thank the team at the uh, Helix again. It's been a fantastic event. I know there's been volunteers here, uh, all of the management team. You've made it extremely easy for us. Uh, to Siobhan, who did a great job emceeing. Uh, and then finally to uh, our, our funders and supporters, um, DCU gave us some funding to, to have this conference here today and also Yako, uh, thank you because the Finnish Institute uh, in London uh, supported some of our speakers coming today. So thank you all to the audience too for coming, it's been a great event and please uh, take inspiration home with you and travel safely. <laughs>